It's a pity we haven't got somebody here from the European Commission tonight, particularly the people inside the European Commission who have been working on the European Commission studies. And I don't know why we don't have them here, because, of course, the European Commission has had a study commissioned, and it has been peer-reviewed. So I would like to see their statistics, hear their experts answer some of the points we've had here, because we're hearing people who have been working on you know, different things, but I think we need to hear from the experts inside the European Commission as well about their studies to hear the whole argument. Because we were asked, why are policymakers spending a lot of time on this? The truth is, my question is, if it's not such a big deal, why are so many companies spending so much time lobbying about this? Because this has delayed the implementation of this directive by months and months and months. This, we were due to have the standard months ago, before Christmas. It's been delayed because of lobbying. Lobbying by people around the Commission, trying to delay things, asking for more and more studies. And the tactics of the lobbyists keep changing. One minute they say, first of all, it started as, oh, it should be just treated like normal oil, because it's just like normal oil. Then we have a new story, oh no, we need it differentiated. So every time the Commission comes near a decision, we have a new tactic by the lobbyists. And that's the real truth about what has happened. And we haven't talked at all about the standard in the United States that has been set by the Californian government, which have also already recognized that tar sands are different from normal crews. And they are putting a different value on tar sands. And now in other parts of the United States, people are looking at the US, the US signal. So, um, so we as policymakers are spending a lot of time because of the lobbying that's gone on. Originally, people should be aware that the original Commission proposal had a separate value for tar sands. That tar sand value disappeared. Therefore, MEP started asking why has it disappeared, and then it's now, because of a lot of pressure, the whole issue has been reopened again. So it's, um, we, want this, we want the law to be implemented. We want the law to be implemented on time. Yes, it's only one part of a big package of climate change legislation. Yes, we need to do more on tackling other sources, but we are doing those things as well. This is a package of legislation, as Satya Hassi has said, tackling emissions from vehicles at source, tackling in many ways. I think so. I don't know why the European Commission have, have maybe they were asked, they didn't want to come, but we really should have had an expert from the European Commission to put the, that side of the story as well about the long studies they have been doing on this very important issue. And, um, and it would be interesting as well to hear about more about um, what happened in the United States because, of course, it's about here a market signal. That's what we're really talking about. The truth about the future of climate policy is major decisions on investment have been taken about where to put funding, where to put resources. If we send a mar market signal that we want, that we accept a future which is based on, on oil, which is in fact not getting cleaner but getting dirtier, then that that sets the market direction as well. So we spend time because we are lobbied and the lobbying doesn't go away and the lobbying keeps shifting its ground every time the Commission comes near to a decision. Um, can I just say one thing in, in terms of uh, arranging this event? We did uh, uh, in, invite uh, representatives of the Commission to take part. Uh, I understand that there are some people from the Commission in this evening and I invite them to uh, to uh, um, state their views, or um, it's, uh, it's clearly a piece of this debate that uh, uh, is slightly absent, and I think all stakeholders would agree that uh, th that, that gap needs filling. Um, so I, I'll leave that up to you. I think, um, Pierre, you wanted to come in, and then Samantha, you wanted to come in on the Californian standard. There's, there's so much that has been said. First of all, you know, California can, can do stupid things. Uh, you know, they capped the price on the electricity markets in the late 1990s, and in 2001, guess what? Uh, it exploded, okay? So we don't have to emulate everything that California does. Um, the, but more, more, more seriously, you, you're asking me why people are lobbying around that. I think it's a very good question, you know? I think it's a very good question. I really don't know why Canada is fighting this. Canada, sorry, is fighting this battle. You know, if he, the EU wants to regulate, let the, let them regulate. That is not going to change anything to the net present value of Canada tar sands. You know, the reserves in the ground. It's not going to change anything. Um, so, but it's a question for Canada. Then there's the question of climate policy. You know. Um, 
I mean, um, Madam, sorry, I forgot your name, but um, you, you made a good case for a global agreement on climate change, but you do not make a good case for doing it alone if there's no, is there no, there's no international agreement. And the European idea that because we are doing it anyway, others are going to follow eventually, is now proven wrong. I'm sorry, I mean, it's not me who ridiculed the EU climate policy, it's been ridiculed by reality, okay? In Copenhagen and the month, you know, and, and, and everything that has, that has followed since. So this idea that, uh, you know, five million things could well argue that there are only five million, but if everybody does that, we don't, you know, we don't make progress. I think it's another way of saying, if only we could agree globally on, a, on an effective climate regime, then we should do it. Uh, we've been trying for 20 years. There's not been any progress. And the idea that because the EU does it anyway at its own cost, others will follow, is now proven wrong. Um, then, I mean, I think that, the, I, I, I am not prepared this point, but I think that the opportunity cost of EU policymakers' time is a more powerful point than I, than, than I, than I thought it was when I, when I first mentioned it a few minutes ago. Because there are very, very serious problems in the EU climate policy that are well worth some of your and, and the Commission's time and that are not addressed. And the biggest one, I think, is the fact that the renewables policy basically destroys the ETS. The cap no, no, the, we have a cap-and-trade regime. The cap of the, uh, the sectors that, you know, that, are, that are under the ETS sets the amount of emission by definition. We're going to emit that. If within the cap you push renewables, you depress the price. So more renewables in Germany means more coal in Poland. More renewables in Scotland means more coal in Spain. This is not additional. This doesn't, you know, our renewables policy does not reduce, reduce CO2 emissions at all. That is intellectually easy to fix. I think it's what you spend, you should spend your time on. Okay, thank you. I, I don't want to broaden this out into a debate about the, the failings or otherwise of the ETS system, but Samantha, you wanted to say something on the Californians. wanted to respond to as well, but I will just quickly say why Canada is, uh, is here and, and why we have been speaking to the Commission and why we've been working so hard on this file for two years. And that is precisely about sending the right signals. And we find it um, discouraging that the Commission uh, would contemplate sending a signal that all oil sources are the same with the exception of the oil sands when we know that that is simply not the case. And when the Commission has this data, this data has been provided to them. When we know that the EU crude diet is relatively high and is a high carbon intensive crude diet, and yet that will be ignored. That will be ignored and there will be this separate default value for oil sands, which will not in one iota reduce the emissions of the EU transport uh, fuel supply. So for Canada, this is about the signal that this sends. For us, it's about the policy. And EU policy needs to be based on the full picture. And how the EU goes about implementing it once they have the full picture, as long as it's applied evenly across the board, whether that means individual default values for all crudes and, you know, however they would try to implement that in a very imperfect world of imperfect data. That's their, you know, prerogative to try and sort out. But to try and to create a false reality where you have a single picture of crude emissions and a separate default value, a separate treatment for one other source of oil, that is why we're here, because we want the policy to reflect uh, reality, the reality of the emissions. Thanks, Nusha. Yeah, and then Mrs. Hassi. Um, 
I have to say that I don't subscribe to the view that, well, two views that you expressed. First of all, no point in doing climate action if not everyone is on board. Second point, all the oil that we have in the world will get used. And that's basically for two reasons. One reason is, why are we here discussing this issue? It's because the EU has a very strong power of setting the standards. And we see that on several issues. We see that in transport a lot, EU sets the standards that gets copied by the rest of the world. We set a standard for cars that now India is considering. <coughs> After EU set a standard for cars, US moved ahead as well. So EU is really, let's say, um, a leader on regulation, environmental regulation. And this is why we're having so much debate on whether tar sands should get a different value or not, because everyone agrees, science is clear, there are more CO2. Should EU act? Well, we are convinced it should, because science is clear, we're basing, we have done all these studies which has delayed the process, but now we have very strong basis for acting. And um, in terms of tar sands development, there are two barriers. One of them is financial cost, the other one is environmental cost. And with high oil prices, uh, investing in tar sands looks good. This is the whole reason why we have to build in the environmental cost, the price of CO2 emissions, which are substantial, the price for destruction of boreal forests and all water destructions and all these other things that we haven't even discussed because this is about CO2 emissions. So also that companies, European companies, that investing in this source of energy don't find themselves in with stranded assets in a couple of decades when we really do get serious about fighting climate change. Okay. Mrs. Hassi, you want to come in? Then we had a couple more questions from the audience. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, at this point by, by Nusha um, on EU being a standard setter, that's a very, very relevant point. Uh, and actually we see that also in many other um, at least environmental policy fields. Um, some years ago I worked a lot on um, EU chemicals uh, regulation reach and uh, uh, today uh, China has a special reach office in Helsinki where the EU chemical agency is because uh, well uh, they import a lot, they have to uh, follow reach um, concerning the import to Europe, but also in, 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 um, in many fields of, of environmental uh, legislation and also health-linked norms, uh, EU legislation is more or less copied after some delay uh, by, by many other countries. So we should not forget this uh, uh, aspect. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, uh, well, two more comments. Uh, uh, the point on singling out uh, tar sand oil, uh, 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 that's not the case. There are, in the draft decision, there are several default values. But as uh, Nusha Urbanchi uh, said, uh, uh, there is uh, a lobbying uh, against uh, on, only the tar sand uh, default value, not, not from other industries, from other uh, unconventional uh, um, sources of, of fuel. And then concerning the climate policy as a whole, I uh, see that Mrs. Mr. Noel is not very well informed uh, about the climate policy. Uh, in Copenhagen, uh, we didn't reach what uh, EU wanted and many others wanted too. But last year, in December in Cancun, uh, uh, the global community and uh, the cl climate conference agreed a United Nations uh, decision which uh, contains uh, uh, climate targets for practically all major emitters. That's a United Nations decision now. Uh, we don't yet have a post-2012 uh, uh, comprehensive um, uh, international climate agreement, but we do have uh, climate targets for most of the relevant emitters, so it's uh, outdated to speak uh, of uh, unilateral EU, EU policy. And when we look at uh, more carefully uh, 
the climate policies of, of many countries. Uh, the measures um, and the policies, they vary, but uh, many countries have good uh, case in saying that they, their climate policies are more ambitious than ours. I have worked uh, more than 10 years with climate poli politics and I have learned that every country, uh, including EU, uh, has a tendency to uh, choose the comparison data in such a way that uh, the one who is speaker uh, uh, represents uh, <coughs> Uh, himself in the greenest possible light. But if you choose uh, another set of data for the comparison, then uh, there are other ones who are the greenest ones and, and, and some others are, uh, are less green than, uh, than they would themselves uh, like to say. So uh, uh, I, would, I would be really, uh, I would like everybody to understand that uh, the uh, talk of um, climate policy being unilateral here, um, that's outdated. And it's a fact that we are an important example for many, many countries in the world. Okay, thank you. Samantha, I think you might bring us back to the oil sands issue by talking about the Californian standard. And then we, I really want to take some of the questions from the floor because this. Absolutely, this will be very brief. Um, I've done a lot of work on, on understanding the California standard. And in fact, it's how I came to looking at the European standard. The way that California works is there's an emissions threshold. And if crudes are above that threshold, then they're treated separately. It's not specific to oil sands. It considers all high carbon crudes. I'll also add that how to think about this in the context of a low carbon fuel standard is really a live issue. California is looking at it one way. The EU is looking at it one way. British Columbia is doing it another way. And it, you'll see from Pierre all the way down to Noosa, everyone on this panel will agree that oil sands have higher greenhouse gas emissions than many other sources of crude. The live issue is how policymakers should deal with this. Okay. We have a question there in the front row, and then we'll come over to this side. To, uh, not in the front row, the second row. Do you still have a question, sir? Could you say uh, who, you, who you are and if your question is directed at one of the panelists? Thanks. <coughs> Uwe Fritscher, Eco Institute in Germany. Um, I, I'm a scientist, I should say, and I do some work on life cycle analysis, on <coughs> including unconventional oil, and I would question um, what was presented here, that there nearly is no work carried out on the life cycle of conventional fuels, so it's just wrong. Um, in the 80s and in the 90s and in the first half of the 2000s, the US EPA, J Japan, the European Union, there have been three consecutive studies on the life cycles of transport fuels um, you know, uh, published, including the oil industry. And after Cancun, we have the fortunate situation that also non-Annex One countries, developing and emerging economies, agreed to inventorize their territorial greenhouse gas emissions and to, to, to give this information to the, to the public and being subject to be reviewed. So you can go now to the Ukraine, you can go to Russia, and you see biannual reports on their greenhouse gas emissions on their territory. And that includes crude oil, gas, coal extraction. You can question if the numbers are right. You should. I have been part of country review team going there for the IPCC and also for the UNFCCC for the office. And clearly there's a room for approval. But we also have received similar questions for European countries and their inventories. So this is what science is all about, it's progress. So we should say clearly there is evidence, the evidence gets better, and draw a conclusion from the better evidence. Similarly, five years ago, nobody had an understanding on, on biofuels, which was mentioned. Nowadays, we have invested in that, and now we have a quite good understanding on differentiated fuels. So I really would like to hear why are you arguing that there is really no study out there? That's, that's wrong. The studies have been, and there hasn't been much development on the oil, coal, and gas sector, and in parallel to the oil sands and, and tar sands debate, there's a debate about unconventional gas. And there's also a greenhouse gas footprint debate about that, and rightfully so. So I, I think you are absolutely not alone. And I just think there's more science out there already, which gives you quite a good background. Okay, Samantha market. and Jeanette want to come on this. If you can give quite short answers, let's try and take as many of the absolutely. questions we have. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. There are definitely studies that, that have been done. Uh, there's more that needs to be done. I agree, I can't remember who said it first, that the oil sands are one of the most studied sources. Um, one of the things that we notice with these data 
if you compare the inventories that various oil produ producing companies put out, and then you look at satellite photos, where you can see the amount of flaring that happens, there's some pretty serious discrepancies there. We would re I agree with you that good work has been done by very reputable organizations, and we're delighted to see that. All we're saying is that we'd like to see more, and that we definitely see some discrepancies. That's all. Don't, don't mean to uh, diss anyone else's data. So, Jeanette, yeah. So my point actually is with regards to the specific uh, policy in question, not with regards to studies on conventional uh, oils in, in general. Um, the European uh, DG Klima has based this study, uh, sorry, this policy on a study that produced one average default value. It does not, it did not produce individualized uh, numbers for the different crudes that are coming into Europe. And that has always been a concern of ours, that we are being compared to one average and that there is not a, the full picture of the carbon intensity of the EU crude basket is not represented in, this, uh, in the policy development here. So whether or not those policies exist, or those studies exist, if, they, if they're existing, then it's, it's even more questionable why they weren't uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this uh, policy. Uh, OK. OK, the lady in, in white. Um, I'm Elizabeth Rodeberg. I'm with the US Chamber of Commerce here in Brussels. Um, I'm asking for the floor or wanting to address the panel and ask, ask them a fundamental question, and that is, what are the practicalities involved in implementing this? I mean, the discussion so far has been enlightening and interesting, uh, very theoretical, um, but there's been no discussion of the practicalities. Those of you sitting in the panel, I'm certain, are aware that the United States imports oil from Canada. Half of those imports are derived from fields um, coming from oil sands fields. I'm not sure how many of you think of how that oil is transported to the United States. It's not secluded. It's not put in, a, in separate uh, transport trucks. It runs through pipelines along with other oils. It gets mixed along with other oils. It gets mixed in refineries along with other oils. Some might then say, OK. The practical conclusion of that is uh, don't export anything to the EU. And probably most of you don't think that the US does export fuels to the EU. But there is, a, and probably Ms. Groves can tell you a lot more about this, there is a very practical exchange between the EU and the United States. The EU exports gasoline to the United States, and the United States exports diesel to the EU at the level around 400,000 barrels a day. 20% of US exports of refined petroleum products go to the EU. Now, admittedly, I, that's... I'm, I'm sorry, that it, it's, it, I've given you quite a bit of time. Who, who feels qualified to talk about the practicalities? I think the, the question is, rather, is very clear. Lucy, do you want to speak? And then if, um, yeah, we can do it. No. Yeah, I know it should. If wishes were horses. OK. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. OK. So um, if you call it a directive, in any case, the, the text of the law that was already adopted obliges fuel suppliers to report carbon intensity of their crudes. So everyone will have to report anyway. And then some fuel suppliers that will fall in the high carbon intensity category, so different higher default values, will also be able to report the improvements in their carbon intensity. And this is the system, exactly the system that we have in place for biofuels. Biofuels represent 4% of the market. So 
I don't see how European Commission can, let's say, force so many rules on 4% of the fuel markets and ignore 